Uh, let's begin tonight in what will be our, uh, really a journey into the church of the book of Acts. Uh, I would title this The Church, and I want to subtitle this tonight, In This For Good. Give me my first text, oh, oh, because I want to show you why I come up with this subtitle, and we've got some things I want to say. Um, Acts chapter 1, verse 14, the Message Bible says this, They agreed they were in this for good, completely together in prayer, the women included, also Jesus, Mother Mary, and his brothers. This is a verse that doesn't, doesn't really have to speak to you in the moment. It just speaks to this whole idea of the church. I thought it was a really good first line, this idea that they decided they were, and that's my title tonight, in this for good. That's really what the book of Acts takes off from, this idea that we are a band of brothers and sisters rallying around the idea of a resurrected Jesus, and we are in this for good. So let me give you a couple of opening thoughts. Um, first of all, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here, okay? I'm not trying to come up with answers to what the church is supposed to look like. I just want to go on a journey with my friends into the book of Acts to see what the church looked like in that first, second, third, fourth iteration. First generation, multiple iterations of the church start to make their way out. I want to explore that with you together as long as that takes us. What does that make us? Well, it makes us a group of brothers and sisters who are in this together, but I think we're in this for good. Um, and I, that doesn't mean forever. That means we're in this family called the church for good. I don't have any intention of leaving the body of Christ. I, where would I go? To whom else would I go? He has the words of eternal life. We're in this for good. We're in this together. We might as well take a journey. I'm not trying to reinvent the idea of church. I'm not trying to start an idea of church. I'm not trying to improve on an idea of church. This is not to establish that a little group is better than a big group. We are not on an expose to try and shed light on the problems of the modern church. You could do that in every era. If you don't think so, read Revelation 2 and 3. First century, we've got seven churches, and most of them got a lot of problems. I mean, that's one generation after Christ, so maybe cut our churches some slack. Um, this is not to say little groups are good, big groups are bad, or vice versa. Little groups are bad, big groups are good. It's not to say you shouldn't have a church building or programs or ministries. It's not to say you should. <laughs> it's not to say that church has to meet in a specified location at a specified time. It's also not saying that's not a pretty good idea sometimes. Okay, so it's not, this isn't to try and put into categories what's right and what's wrong about church. It's really just to try to explore what that looked like. Last week, I brought to you a few ideas about the church in a real short segment that we called the church. One of those ideas was from Matthew where Jesus said, you are Peter, on this rock I'll build my church. I made this statement to you that I think what Jesus is saying is that he's going to build his church on the revelation that Peter had, which is not unique to Peter. It's the revelation we all have. Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, I know Jesus meant himself to be the rock. Yes, he's going to build on the rock, but it doesn't seem to make much sense to me for Jesus to build the church and tell Peter he's going to do it if there's nothing for us to do. So I know Jesus builds the church, and I know we can get in the way of that. But I also believe he builds the church in us and through us. We are his church. If he's building his church and we are his church, He's building us. What's he building us on? I think he's building us on an ongoing revelation of who he is. A little bit about what, what we talked about in that monthly meeting, that as we partake of Jesus, we grow into who he would have us to be. And another thing, I'm just doing little points of order, little cleanups in my own head um, that I try to do during the week to say, how would I start if I could get one more shot to fix something from the week before or shore something up? Um, buildings. Church structures are not bad things. <laughs> um, they are good things. They are cultural things. The early church didn't have them, but it wasn't because they wouldn't have wanted one. It was because it was a different world and a different economy, and the church of that day was persecuted to the point that they couldn't even meet out in the open. So this idea that because you have a church with a sign makes you somehow less than the church of the book of Acts, is that's silly. If, I, I got a feeling that if the church in the book of Acts found out they could meet in a building and stick a sign out front and invite people to come in and meet with them, they'd have been all in on that real estate. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with buildings and there's nothing wrong with trying to make them look good and make them presentable. 
There is something wrong with thinking that that somehow constitutes a church. Yes, there is something wrong with making that the goal of the church. And the only reason I'm down on that, and I admit I am a little down on it, so I'll just say it, I am a little down on it because I've been inside that machine and I know that what happens all too often is that becomes the focus for everything we do. Try to get bigger, try to fill this building, try to pay this one off so we can build another one, try to get more land, try to move to the better, the better side of town. And, it just happens that we end up oftentimes showing the darkest side of our natures when we start trying to build structures rather than let Christ build the church. Okay, can Christ build the church in buildings? You can't build a building big enough to house Christ's church. So yes, he can build a church in buildings, but he doesn't build buildings. All right, we build buildings, and that's okay. Uh, keep, that, keep those two thoughts separate, and I think we're okay when we look at the church. All right, I want to begin tonight um, with a quote, and it's a super long one. And so, because I know you like to grab the quotes and sometimes jot them down, um, I went ahead and printed it for you because it's too long. We're going to put it on the screen because we have video and a crowd that watches online, and so I want them to have access to that. And so if you're watching, you're going to see whatever anyone else in our room sees. You don't have to keep this if you don't want it. Um, but this is, this is a quote from Eugene Peterson's book, The Pastor, a memoir, one of, my, one of my very enjoyable reads from one of my favorite Christian pastors. He's gone to be with Jesus now, uh, but his writings will live on. And, and he pastored a successful church. And su by successful, I mean uh, they survived the storms and the persecutions and the problems in the Baltimore area, um, Christ the King Presbyterian Church. Uh, I had a fun time reading his memoir because it spoke of the book of Acts and the church, and I will admit it's actually been a motivator for me to dig into the book of Acts to take a look at the church. So I'll read that, and you can, you'll have your own copy of it, and I'll want to work through it just a little bit. I, I understand this is not scripture, and I, I'm saying that for those watching and listening. I understand this is not Bible. This is a man's opinion of the church, but I, thought, I like this thought about Acts. Acts is not a manual. With blueprints and a set of instructions on how to be a church, Acts is not a utopian fantasy on what a perfect church would look like. Acts is a detailed story of the ways in which the first church became a church. I like that phrase. The ways in which the first, they're already the first church, whether they like it or not. But the ways in which they became what we call church. And a story is not a script to be copied. Think about that. And I put a couple of thoughts together here of my own that basically, if, if you came up in church circles in any way like I did, we viewed the book of Acts as a blueprint. In fact, we used to say that. I've heard that said in the pulpit. The book of Acts is a blueprint for what the church is supposed to look like. And I think Eugene Peterson must have heard that a lot too and, and realized that there needs to be some pushback against that because as we're gonna learn in the book of Acts, it's not a blueprint. It is got, not God saying, this is how you should do things. In fact, there's a few moments where I've got a feeling the Holy Spirit went, oh boy, this is not how we wanna keep doing this. We gotta clean this up. Because that's what happens when you raise kids. I mean, when you have a baby and it gets a little bigger, it breaks stuff and poops on itself and slobbers everywhere and throws food. And that's the church in the book of Acts. And it's struggling to get its footing and it falls down a lot while it's trying to learn to walk. So we're not trying to copy it. A story is not a script. A story is a story. That's what the book of Acts is telling you. A story develops a narrative sense in us so that we are alert to the story of Jesus and we will be present and obedient and believing as we participate in the ways that the Holy Spirit is forming the Jesus life in us. That's a phrase I really like. That's something I've been praying a lot about lately is spirit form the Jesus life in me. What does it look like to have the Jesus life fully formed in Paul White? What does the Jesus life look like in Matt? What does the Jesus look like in Amber? It, the Jesus is real in you. His life is real in you. And it's sort of, it's not cookie cutter. He's developing all of us to be the same Jesus. It's he's, looking like Jesus through your form. That's the beauty of it. You're his kid and he loves to see himself in your eyes. You love to see yourself in your kid's eyes. You don't want your kids, if you have multiple kids, you don't want your kids to be exactly the same. And it would be super weird if they looked exactly like you and walked exactly like you and talked exactly like you. You don't want that. 
and so you want something unique, and that's exactly what we have. I love that idea of the Jesus life being formed in us. The plot, Jesus, he is the plot of the story, is the same. The same in the church of Acts and the same in the church of today, but the actual places, the actual circumstances and names will be different. And they'll form a narrative that is unique to our time and our place and our circumstances and our people. So while the book of Acts is going to have its dates and its locations and its people and its story, it isn't that we're emulating that detail by detail. We have our own dates and places and people and story. You've been a part of a date and a place and a people and a story in this room for a few years. And you're being a part of another story somewhere else that's separate from this, but it's a part of your own narrative and that's what we're examining. Churches are not franchises to be reproduced as exactly as possible wherever and whenever in Rome and Moscow and London and Baltimore. The only thing changed being the translation of the menu. I've been saying for a while that I think one of our issues in the American church is that we have franchised the church. That we go off and we see how someone else did it successfully in, in a certain place. We hold a conference on that. We, we sign up, we buy the manuals, we buy the t-shirts and the banners. We come back to our church and we implement all of their programs and we buy their buses and we shoot their videos and we put up their light rigging and we run our church the way they run their church and we think that that will work and some of it actually kind of pulls a few people in and it works and hey, they're selling Big Macs, we'll sell Big Macs, that kind of thing. Um, and I think we're gonna find in the book of Acts that they, it didn't have to be that way and I don't think it had to be that way then, it doesn't have to be that way now. I think it's one of the things that have hurt us in the American church is this idea of franchising the model of the Holy Spirit. I, 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 this is just something that came to me standing here and I actually had a conversation with a pastor today and this came up. Um, there's no substitute for the moment in, at the wedding of Cana where Mary says to the host, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. There's no substitute for your, in your life for that. And it's still the most relevant words I think we have in following the Lord is whatever he says to you, do it. That is not just your, your day-to-day life. That is the life of the church. What the Lord says to do in Flowery Branch, Georgia might not be what the Lord says to do in Marietta, Georgia. And it might not be what he says to do in Miami, Florida or Los Angeles. And it's not because God's fickle and he's changing his mind or he's just trying stuff, you know, throwing stuff against the wall to see what works. It's because he's the opposite of all of that. It's because he's unique and he has unique people in Flowery Branch, Georgia and Los Angeles, California. And he's unique to the people because he's forming himself in them. And it's why we can't franchise the Holy Spirit because we're not just trying to get the widest, broadest palate to like the same taste of hamburger. We're presenting a Holy Spirit that is unique to the individual and the church is a corporate, a corporate body of individuals. That's hard to pull off. The Holy Spirit can do that. And allowing people to be uniquely themselves is the, is the formula in which he uses. But if we don't acquire a narrative sense, a story sense, with the expectation that we are each one of us uniquely ourselves. See, I kind of got ahead of myself there. That, well, I didn't write this, but I was flowing, I guess, a little bit with where we were going. Uh, we are each one uniquely ourselves. We are participants in the unique place and time and weather of where we live and worship. I like that phrase, the weather of where we live and worship, because... That's a good allegory. There is a different weather in each spot, a different atmosphere, a different temperature. And we will always be looking somewhere else or to a different century for a model by which we can be an authentic and biblical church. How true is this? The usefulness of Acts. I'm gonna, let me get out of this so we can get into the text. The usefulness of Acts as a story, not as a prescription or an admonition. Good thought. Not a prescription for how to do it, not an admonition for not how to do it. The usefulness of that book is that it keeps us faithful to the plot. The plot is Jesus. And at the same time, we are free to respond out of our own circumstances and our own obedience. We are not slaves to the church at Jerusalem or the church at Samaria or the church at Smyrna or the church at Thyatira. We use them as a plot. We use them as a narrative. But the plot, Jesus, 
moves uniquely around us. That's Eugene Peterson's The Pastor, a memoir, 2011. Highly recommend if you're looking for a good read of someone who took this journey. Let's read from the book of Acts. We are not going to read every verse of the book of Acts, but I just thought it would be a good way to start to read the first several. From Acts chapter 1, let's start in verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The former accounts the book of Luke, by the way. Luke is the author of Acts. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. He writes it to someone named Theophilus. We don't know 100% who that is. Until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. This is the resurrection and the, the visible evidence, what Paul would later say was over 500 people who saw the, res the resurrected Jesus being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 40 days being a mirror of Jesus' time in the wilderness, 40 days being a mirror of a greater number, 40 years as will, Israel goes through that wilderness and you know the 40 days that Elijah's by the brook and all of the, or, uh, or that, that he sets through the famine, all of those 40s. Uh, go back one, I just wanna show you one thing. Look at what he's talking about. Speaks of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. All right, kingdom of God, present possession, future possession as well. Jesus told the disciples that he wouldn't eat or he was not going to drink from the vine until he was in his father's kingdom. Interestingly enough, he will eat and drink with the disciples after the resurrection. So where's the father's kingdom? Not 10,000 years in the future. Jesus is still waiting to drink his wine. He drinks wine with you every time you take communion. That's the visible presence of the kingdom of God, or at least one of the visible presences of the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, because that's what they do, they assemble. This will happen repeatedly in the book of Acts. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that becomes the great promise of the Father that the early church would receive what we call the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. What I want to do in this journey is I want to take a look here and there, whenever it pops up, at the way the early church thought. I want to look at the way the early church acted. I want to look at the way they responded to their environment. I want to look at what they did with the Holy Spirit. I want to look at that not so we can copy it. That's why I did that whole Eugene Peterson idea. But I also want to look at it not so we can cut them down. This isn't us trying to expose the early church for faults and failures, nor is it trying to figure out how to do what they did. I do this a lot lately. I try to sit down with words and go, what are you trying to accomplish here? You know, you're trying to get to the end of this sermon, just have another sermon in the files. I don't, that's not good enough for me anymore to just have another sermon in the falls. What are we trying to do here? I don't want to emulate anybody. I'm not trying to copy anybody. I'm trying to learn from them. You see, I've been raised in the church and I hardly ever heard anybody tell me what it was. I had a lot of people show me what it was because they thought church was what you did. So they go, come on in, we're going to have church. Hear that phrase? Come on in, we're going to have church. And half church was a certain set of formulas. There was a certain, you know, kind of thing you did. Um, I played church as a kid. You know how you play school or you play trucks or whatever? I played school and I played trucks and I played church. And I took a hamper out and I set it in my bedroom and I stood behind that hamper and I pounded away at that <laughs> hamper because that was my pulpit. And I read from my little tabbed Bible with the little plastic tabs on it. And I preached and I paced and I laid hands on people, and I got every teddy bear saved. <laughs> Everyone fell out in the spirit. I mean, it was a... I had church, and we would even... I'd have, we had friends in church, and we, we hung out in people's houses all the time after church, and we would play church, and somebody would sing, and another guy would lead the offering, and we'd take it up in little hats, and, and you know, putting pennies and nickels in it. And uh, we had church. I had a lot of that. I played a lot of church. I participated in a lot of church. I didn't sit in classes where people taught me what the church was. I mean, I didn't, I didn't 
So the closest we got was to go like, well, read the book of Acts. That's what the church is supposed to look like. So I want to do better than that. I don't just want to have church or even, I don't even just want to say we are the church. So our examination of this is to frequently stop and say, what did they think? Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're a little bit right. Maybe they're a little bit wrong. That's okay too. What do I think that looks like how they thought? Maybe I'm a little bit right. Maybe I'm a little bit wrong. Where could I tweak that? What did the church do with that information? What do I do with that information? If I say I'm part of the church, what does that look like in light of this information? So this is the first moment that I want to do this in the book of Acts. I tell you, it will not be the last. We will wear this idea out that it's time to stop and take a look at what the church just said because they don't have a building and a sign and business cards and a van right here, but they're a church. They're assembled. They're with Jesus. They're a church, like it or not. Somebody, I, I told someone today, are you a pastor? Well, we assemble, we talk about Jesus, we build one another up, we don't have a sign, we don't have a name, we don't have a van, but yeah, it's a church. Because in its classic definition, that's kind of what's going on. So let's take a moment and look at the first instinct of the early church. Look at that text one more time. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea, Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. What did they ask? Are you going to give the kingdom to Israel? What did Jesus say? You're going to be witnesses. Look at their first instinct. Here's the first one in the book of Acts. The first instinct of the very earliest iteration of the church was to acquire the knowledge of power. Jesus counters with, it's not for you to know it's for you to receive power from the Spirit. I'll read this and we'll come back to it. Your power comes by receiving. It comes in the realm of the Spirit. Attempts to establish ourselves any other way are misguided and seem to be our default position. I'm going to save this for a second. Let's work on that first one. The reason I say their first instinct was the knowledge of power, because listen to what they say. Hey, Jesus, is this the time that you're going to give the kingdom back to Israel? And Jesus' response is, that's not yours to know which tells me that Jesus does not make a prerequisite on the church knowing everything. The very first iteration of the very first church wanted to know what belonged to them. And Jesus goes, man, not everything is up to you to know. So the first thing I learned about the church is that we don't have to know everything about what we're doing and everywhere that we're going. And, and the knowledge of power, the knowledge of when we get to yield it, the knowledge of when we get to have it seems to be our first instinct. Not only do we want knowledge, we want to know what belongs to us. We want to know what authority is ours. We want to know what we get to stand up for, what we get to stand against. And I think it's a dangerous first default position because we can get infatuated with knowledge. We can fall in love with the knowledge of power and we can fall in love with the acquisition of power. I think one of the worst positions for the church to be is when it falls in love with power and authority. When everything goes her way, the church gets soft. She gets an underbelly. She's not real good at motion, real good at moving. She's not good at doing what she's supposed to do. It's interesting that Christ's counter is you shall receive power. What's their question? When do we get it? He goes, not yours to know, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So it tells me that the power the church need doesn't come by knowledge or by the state or by the authorities, but by receiving. You know what we are? We're a family of receivers. We receive our grace. We receive our love. Oh, we're eventually a family of givers. You're going to see that in the book of Acts too, because you can't hold on to what you've been given. You got to let it go. You got to start to spread that good news. But we are first receivers. We're not earners. Where the church goes to seed is when it becomes a religious breeding ground for earners and good performers. When it becomes about doing better, getting more, acquiring more, brownie point religion. Doesn't work. We're at our weakest. We're at our weakest. We're at a weak point when we seek the knowledge of power. We're at a weak point whenever it becomes about what we do instead of what we receive. It seems to be our default position. Let's go back because I want to show you their second instinct. Verse 6. When they come together, they asked him, saying, I want you to notice, just take some time with this question. Teach you a little Bible study technique here. Don't go too fast. That's step one. When you read the Bible, slow down, particularly when you already know what you're reading. 
because that's even worse. Because when you know what you're reading, you're just reading, you're just kicking it out there. You're not even really paying it. I'm, this is my, I have a bad habit of this. Like, I'm going to read that chapter. Well, I've read that chapter four or 500 times in my life in every translation I can get my hands on. So if I really want to get something out of it, I've got to slow down, chew on it a little bit, you know, kind of figure out what it tastes like. Don't just swallow it. So chew on this question. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, now I already told you that Jesus is going to tell them it's not yours to know. Stop with the knowledge game. Stop trying to figure stuff out. Your first instinct is to figure stuff out. What's the other problem with this question? I mean, knowing what you know about Jesus, knowing what you know about the cross, knowing what you know about redemption, knowing what you know about, this is the dead giveaway here, knowing what you know about the universality of the new covenant, that everybody gets in. What's wrong with this question? Lord, will you restore the kingdom again to Israel? They can't think outside of their own people group. This is the, the, breeding, the starting point for this, okay? Now, here's their second instinct. Their second instinct is to assume that they were the target audience of the Holy Spirit. I see this as the earliest version of us versus them, and it's in the very first chapter of Acts. It's almost a default position for us to land on the we, we got this thing, they don't have this thing, isn't this our thing, don't you want to do this in our group? How do I know? Look at their question. Will you restore it to Israel? What's his answer? You don't need to know the time and the place. But that's not the end of his answer. His answer is actually, you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Did you notice that we bust out of Israel in that description pretty fast? So Jesus' answer ignores that whole kingdom of Israel stuff and starts to include a bunch of stuff outside of Israel. This is actually a geographic direction. Jerusalem is inside of Judea, which butts up next to Samaria, and then the ends of the earth is everything outside of that. Even places they couldn't have known existed, like good old North America, that are not in their geographical purview. And yet Jesus goes, the ends of the earth is someday going to receive this. He couldn't tell them that. Hey, there's a place far off across the ocean, and uh, you're going to take it over. They didn't need to know that. What they needed to know was it isn't just them. It isn't just the us. Jesus expands past Israel. He shows the church to be a place without borders and a place without loyalties. I almost didn't put this in. I'd, almost, I'd finished this thought and thought, no, it, there's one other thing that Jesus wants there. And the reason why I throw in with lo without loyalties is because he says you're going to receive the Holy Spirit to be witnesses for Christ which means what we're going to go out and be an ambassador of is not other things. We're not an ambassador for our version of Christianity. We're going to go out and be an ambassador for Christ. We're not an ambassador for the way we do things, the way we prefer things, but an ambassador for Christ, which means no borders, no loyalties to anything but Jesus. Let me show you how the message reads. Let's start with the New King James of this next part. New King James 1, 9, 10, 11. After Jesus had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into the heavens. Look, look, look at the characters here. First of all, Jesus is taken up, cloud receives him, boom, he's gone. And while they are staring at where he was, they see two angels. And this is a, this is a, 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 a biblical repeat, okay? Because in the open tomb, there are two angels, one sitting at the head, one at the feet. And then you can take that line and take it not just to the tomb, but you can drag that line all the way back to the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant where there are two cherubim, their angel wings touch one another over the mercy seat. Mercy seat, by the way, in the Septuagint, the Old Testament translated into Greek. Mercy seat in the, trans, in the, in the uh, Septuagint is translated propitiation. So sitting on top of the Ark is the propitiation. 
John will then grab that and say, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. So when Jesus is seated with the Father, he sits on top of the mercy seat, the angel's arms over him. He comes out of the grave. He goes into the heavens to sit. Where does he go? He goes right in between two angels to sit. And those angels say, men of Galilee, why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like man. I want to show you the message here. Listen to this. These were his last words. As they watched, he was taken up and disappeared in a cloud. They stood there, staring into the empty sky. Suddenly, two men appeared in white robes. I don't know why he needed an explanation point, but I kind of like it. White robes! And said, You Galileans, why do you just stand here looking up at an empty sky? This very Jesus who was taken up from among you to heaven will come as certainly and mysteriously as he left. I like that word because it nails it because no one could, could explain what they just saw because they've never had an equivalent of it. I don't anything to compare this to. We're talking to him one minute, he's gone the next. It's a great mystery. We can't really explain what we have just seen. This is the most underpreached moment in Christianity that holds the greatest weight. And it's like we just haven't had a revelation of it, particularly in the Western church. Our Eastern church world, our Eastern Orthodox brethren, they nail this moment. They're really good with the ascension. The American church is bad with it. Like we love to preach the birth, the nativity. We love to preach the life, baptisms, healings, miracles, walk on water, feed 5,000. We love to preach the death, the cross. We love to preach the resurrection. We love to preach the early church and the epistles. But how many sermons have you heard on the ascension? I mean, we don't even mark it on the Christian calendar. The Orthodox Church at least has Ascension Day. We don't even have Ascension Day. I mean, we, you know, we, we don't even honor it. I think we're missing something here. Let me, let me, let me show you why. The ascension marks the space between the resurrection and Pentecost, between our coming alive and our receiving power. It's the moment between the birth of the child and the child drawing its first breath. That's a tense moment. You bring that baby out and it hasn't breathed yet. So all of this life lay in there, but it hasn't done the one thing that makes it permanently human. You wait on that moment. They smack its bottom. They try and fill those lungs with air because that will be the first breath of the rest of their life, both figuratively and literally. And it's that moment where the hopes and the dreams of an entire lifetime are found in that moment. How appropriate that Revelation 4 lives right here. By the way, I'll show you. I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Because in Revelation 4, the lion is the lamb. And the lion reappears as a slain lamb mysteriously. Every time we see him that way, he reappears in us over and over and over again. Every revelation you have of Jesus, you have of what his blood did for you, what his blood paid for on your behalf. That is a reappearance of Christ. Say what you will about a physical return of Jesus Praise God, but give me the mysterious reappearings of Jesus over and over and over again. The reason that I said the ascension lives in Revelation 4 is up until Revelation 4, John has been like, hey, the angel, Jesus has been saying, write this to this church, write this to this church. You know these churches. You've been to these churches. You've preached in these churches. You helped build these churches. In chapter 4, come here. I'm going to show you the stuff to come here after. And hereafter doesn't mean I'm going to show you the stuff on the timeline in 2020. I think hereafter means, come here, I'm going to show you the hereafter. I'm going to show you what it looks like on the other side of the veil. Step through this curtain, John. Turn around and look at the cross and the empty tomb through the lens of heaven. And what does he see in Revelation 4? Shouting and rejoicing and they're falling down in heaven as the lion walks in, dripping with blood like a slain lamb. And John can't stay on his feet because he's watching the seating of the Jesus who just ascended into glory and sits at the right hand of the Father. And the early church 
draws its breath right there as Jesus disappears. He said, well, how, how am I so confident that this is the moment when they draw their breath? Because they spend the rest of the book of Acts and the rest of the epistles of the New Testament preaching reappearances of Jesus. And they don't just believe that's a future event. They keep preaching Jesus as if he's actually reappearing. So they're either nut jobs or there's something to be said for believing on the reappearance, the mysterious reappearance of the resurrected Jesus. And I don't think they're nut jobs. And I don't think you do either. I think it's why you keep following Jesus. Because you've had enough of his reappearances. I've often thought, go back in time and try to tell the Apostle Paul there's going to be one, one more coming of Jesus. Jesus came, then someday he's going to come again. Paul goes, um, I've seen him several times. I saw him on the road to Damascus. I saw him in Arabia when I was at Mount Sinai. He gave me this new covenant. Don't tell me there's just one. And I think the early church would have all been that way. Like, tell Stephen at his stoning that there's only one appearance of Jesus. When he looks into the heavens and he sees the ascended Jesus. And he says, Father, Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. Take me home. This is, a, this is the driving force. This is the impetus. I know we like to say that Pentecost is what fueled the church. And I'm not going to argue against that. But the ascension, the moment where they watched him disappear and realized that this is real and he is enthroned, the church draws its first breath. And I think when the angels say he's going to reappear in like manner, I think what that means is he's going to reappear mysteriously. He left mysteriously, he's going to reappear mysteriously. And I think he's mysteriously reappearing in you. And in me. And to me, that's why I love the church. Because if you watch her long enough, and you go enough, and you hang out, Jesus makes mysterious reappearances. And you'll never be in a service where anybody deserves it. You know? It's like none of them earned it. They didn't pray it in. It just shows up. I've also been in services where I'm pretty sure he showed up for one person. Like nobody else even felt it, but you look over and here's this person that's, they just saw Jesus. I don't know what it took. They saw Jesus in that song or they saw Jesus in that sermon. They had an encounter with him, mysterious reappearances. And the church keeps going after that. They're not chasing a high. They're chasing the mysterious reappearances of Jesus. What I love about meeting with you guys is we're not chasing an emotional high, but I do chase the mysterious, remarkable, unexpected, and sometimes unbelievable appearances of Jesus that shows up in you. And I realize that we have seen a reappearance of Christ. I'm in that for good. I think that's why the next few verses say we're in this for good. I think they were. What I hope that we accomplish tonight is just a glimpse at a couple of the issues. The very first church, before they ever even realize they're a church, that start to come up and you realize that there's still sort of some of the issues that come up in us. Let's pray. Just allow this word to be what it will inside of us as the church who together are in this for good. Thank you, Father. You are good. And I think that I'm not alone in this room and I know I'm not alone in the many people who watch and listen to this and say, we're in this for good. I'm in this for good, and this, they're in this for good before Pentecost. This didn't have anything to do with tongues and outpourings and miracles. They're in this for good because they've had an encounter with Jesus, and they believe in a mysterious reappearing, and they want to be around when that happens. If I don't go to your church or become part of your church for any other reason, and I've been, Father, following you for four decades... And I don't do it for any other reason. It's because I'm infatuated with the mysterious reappearances of Jesus. I've seen him in prayer time. I've seen him in study time. I've seen him in worship time, in sermon time. And I don't have to go to church to see it, but I sure do love it when I see it in my neighbor. And that's caused me to be in this for good. I thank you as you work this in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.